Finally, Seth Wickersham of ESPN and the author of the New York Times bestselling book, It's Better to Be Feared, the definitive document of the Patriots dynasty, is here. Seth and I had almost an hour-long conversation about big-picture topics around the team. Yes, of course, obligatory references and discussion of the offense and the doomsday talk and all that. But more importantly, before we get into the minutia of the regular season and we get into the scheme and the films and the analytics and the injuries and the storylines and all of that, we zoomed as far out as we ever have here on the pod. And you know I kind of like to go big picture. What we did is talked about with the end of not the dynasty, but the Belichick craft era might look like. Because, again, later this week, we'll have your full matchup preview, Patriots, Dolphins, what to look for, matchup schemes, all that. For now, this is our last moment to talk about an 81-year-old owner and a 70-year-old coach, two of the greatest ever to do it in Belichick's position, clearly the best ever how they come to terms with their end in the NFL. And we're not rooting for this. To be utmost clear about this, neither of us are rooting for it. the Belichick craft era to end at any time, okay? We're not rooting for it to result in more Super Bowls either. It's an exploration of something we've never seen before as football fans. I and mean, we've been doing this with the Patriots dynasty in the discussion forever. But how far does this go? Because Bill Belichick didn't expect to be here. His famous line kind of, you know, quipping about Marv Levy coaching into his 70s. He would never do that. He's doing that now. Okay, Robert Kraft actively looking to get into the Hall of Fame. He's going to get there. But how soon does he do it? And does he bring Bill Belichick with him? Brady and Belichick obviously split in a way we didn't expect. So what happens here? Seth and I dive into that. We talk about his book. He's going to read for some excerpts of the book. If you haven't bought it yet, absolutely do so. So that's what this episode is about. Again, it's a, it's a way to explore what the end might look like, which we don't think, frankly, is coming anytime soon. And I list four major factors that go into this. So again, no predictions, no rooting, just here are the factors at play. Where do we stand with each of these on the field and off? And where they might lead in the future? After all that, quick mailbag, because we had some questions over Labor Day weekend. We'll get to more as we break down the Dolphins later in this week. But until then, after so much teasing and already talking now in an intro that's 30 seconds too long, Seth Wickersham of ESPN. All right, ESPN Seth Wickersham here, author of New York Best Time Selling Book, It's Better to Be Feared, The New England Patriots Dynasty in the Pursuit of Greatness. Um, Seth, I just assumed I had to call you New York Times bestselling author. It's like the old Academy Award winning, you know, you get to be the president. Like, is that is that baked into your contract now? Any other appearances? Did I just do that by accident? No, but I won't oppose it. And frankly, that's not a bad idea. You know, I, I don't mind it. Yeah, very good. Um, well, we're going to get into a lot today. I, I covered this in the intro in terms of big picture stuff. And I know you've done a recent hit on ESPN Daily, which everyone should be listening to daily as it is about the offense. But zooming all the way out, because we're going to get so into the minutia as it always happens week one and under the season and all the way through January. Um, but going backwards now, instead of zooming out for a second, uh, can I ask how the Bahamas were or the Mass Singer set? Like, we're, I have to assume you were in and around <laughs> both of those recently, no? Oh, man. I mean, you know, that was that was a weird trip, you know, and it's just it's just so unlikely for someone like Tom. And obviously, we've seen some reporting in the New York papers um, come out about what it might be. Um, you know, I personally don't know that to be true. But, um, yeah. you know, it was it's an awkward time. And um while I don't think it would affect him, you know, obviously as a player, I don't think that at age 45, he needs those 11 days of training camp. Um, it just kind of adds to the weirdness, right? I mean, it's just been a weird year for Tom Brady. For the longest time, he obviously was able to grow up in the public spotlight and present an image that I think was rooted in fact, largely, that – you know, he kind of had it together, right? I mean, he was calculated. He thought about his choices. Um, going back to, like, his early years with the dynasty and, you know, choosing what um, commercials to do and what endorsements to do based on how many teammates he could get involved, um, the contracts that he would take at the time. Obviously, the, the, the way his contract negotiations, as you know, balanced out over time, but especially those early years, counting three million against the cap when Peyton Manning was at eight or nine million. Um, he always kind of presented a a front and uh, of someone who just sort of had had thought out his choices 
and made the ones that were best for him. And this year has just been a very odd year on the Brady front. Yeah. Well, it's only half over. So we'll see what happens yeah. now with football, which might bring some sort of normalcy for him because that's always been his bedrock, the rhythm of his calendar as it goes for a lot of us. But uh, as an obsessive personality, having that pull and tug of people at home where his I think his Twitter bio is still just football and family, um, you know, or maybe it's the reverse. But either way, there are two things there. And, and that's kind of pulling him apart right now. But Brady is not actually involved in the conversation beyond that that short intro here today. We're getting into the end of the Bill Belichick um Robert Kraft here era. So let's start here. Let's start with your book because your paperback is out. There is a new epilogue from the 2021 season. I have not read it. So part of this is me asking selfishly, but also for the people at home. Give us one Patriots tidbit that you picked up last year after the original publication of your book last October. No, I mean, I appreciate it. And it was interesting because it was just fortuitous, but the book ended up coming out right before <laughs> the Patriots Bucks games and nobody planned that. It was it was a little bit of a, a stroke of publishing luck there. But um, I thought it was a fascinating game. I mean, I read your coverage of it. I read a lot of people's coverage. And I just thought that, like, it, even though the game itself wasn't wasn't pretty, it was obviously in a driving rain. Just, I don't know when in NFL history, in modern NFL history, we got to see two people, two minds go at it like they did. And obviously it went down to the wire. And so that was the beginning. You know, I mean, I just, I felt like the, that exploring that game and adding whatever insight I could into it um, was important. And then um, obviously there, the game was only half of the story. The other half was 20 minutes after the game. When Belichick wandered over to the Bucks locker room, remember we saw that hug lasted like a fraction of a second. Everybody's <laughs> thinking like, okay, that's it. It even caught Al Michaels by mistake, you know, by kind of surprise if you if you listen to the broadcast. Um, but then they disappeared and they disappeared for about 20 minutes. And I'll read a little chunk from that. Then came the hug, if one can call it that. Soon after, Belichick walked from his office to the visitor's locker room to speak with Brady. It seemed as though, even after an amazing game, the true story was just beginning. The two men debriefed for 20 minutes or so. Brady kept the details of the conversation private in subsequent interviews, but it was clear that the talk was one of mutual respect. Brady was forever grateful for the opportunities Belichick had given him to launch his career. Belichick believed Brady had established himself as the greatest player in NFL history. There was a kind of love between the two men after all they had accomplished and endured but there wasn't always a like. Those who spoke with Brady in the following days and weeks could tell that his hard feelings towards his former coach remained. Belichick and Brady were a divorced couple who agreed to get along, agreed to be civil for the sake of everyone, but had no intention of getting remarried. The complexities of a relationship like theirs couldn't be resolved in one post-game conversation, or maybe ever. So, you know, I mean, I think that like, obviously from there, you know, I get into how the season ended and Brady's odd retirement and, you know, where the Patriots kind of stand now as best I could at the moment when I wrote it. But, um, you know, those are the things I tried to address, you know, in the in the paperback. Yeah, well, that was terrific. I mean, that, that's I think everything anyone could ask for without buying the book, which, of course, you're encouraged to if you haven't already. That That's interesting to me where I think it's hard to wash away 20 years, not all animosity, just in 20 minutes. But the gesture from a man like Bill to go and do that in defeat in the locker room and see him, I think also is something we've just never really seen before, at least that publicly. It was a private moment, but he understands what it will mean for people to see him go into the locker room, stay, count the minutes, and then come all the way out. So I I mean, Brady was obviously in a good mood after the game. I was in that press conference. He won. You know, he did it without scoring 20 points. Um, but it's it's interesting that he would still harbor that, you know, I think to, to a degree, like you understand why he would, but also that's a, it's a, it was a big move by Bill. It, it was absolutely a big move by Bill. And, you know, these things have been building for years. And at this point it's well-documented, you know, really since the end of that Falcon Super Bowl, um, you know, when Brady's stature had just changed and they had won five and, you know, he was really getting his business going, and it was something that its presence was causing problems in the Patriots building, and you know the rest is incredibly well documented. Jimmy Garoppolo obviously was in the middle there, kind of a pawn in a larger game, and, and then it culminates in August of 19 when 
it's announced that Brady has agreed to this new contract extension. He considered walking out of training camp because he was so frustrated. Yeah. And then 48 hours later, he and Giselle Bunchen put their Brookline house on the market. So, you know, these things had been had been building. And I thought that one of the most fascinating aspects, just to rewind before that game last October, was Alex Guerrero, Tom Sr., <laughs> really making public, you know, some of the issues that they had with the way the Patriots were run and Brady's departure and winning the Super Bowl the following year with the Bucs and, and what that meant. I mean, mm. the two people on earth who should have known better than to ever underestimate Tom Brady were Bill Belichick and Robert Kraft, and yet they did just that. And it's not fair to say that the franchise is reeling or whatever since that mistake, but given the length and the duration of Brady's career and their career together, it still is one of those surprising personnel decisions that you still look back on and you're wondering like, God, why did they do that? At the same sense, I don't know football well enough to know this, but like apparently Brady's 2019 tape just wasn't pretty at all. Not in the second <laughs> because, half. No, it was gross. Because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, look, they were eight. No, at one point, obviously the offense was, was struggling to get into rhythm. You know, Bronk wasn't there, but, um, you know, Belichick opening the door for Brady to walk out and he walking out. You have John Gruden now that we know about mm -hmm. taking, you know, a look at Brady. Everybody in Las Vegas seemed to want this connection to happen, saying no. Kyle Shanahan, <laughs> you know, everybody looks at, at Kyle for his offensive wizardry. And yet they looked that he he had the entire coaching staff look at every one of his snaps from 2019. And at the end of the day, they decided to stick with Jimmy. So it wasn't just Bill, but in the same sense, again, Bill and Robert Kraft were the two people who should have known better to ever let him walk out. And we saw what happened. Yeah. And now we have two seasons worth of their time apart. Like I remember writing before that game that, look, we're all excited for this game. And I think on the surface, the storylines are obvious, right? It's the greatest coach. It's the greatest quarterback going head to head. But what are the stakes? How much stakes can you have in a week four game? And the only thing that they could gain from apart, being apart after being together for 20 years, in my mind at the time, was validation. And, you know, as much, again, validation as you could have in week four, Brady obviously wins. The Patriots later drop to two and four, but then go 10 and seven, make the playoffs. So, you know, he, he won the divorce. He won the reunion. And since then, I don't know how many people are keeping score, but as far as Robert Kraft and Bill Belichick goes, like they're keeping score all the time. And Kraft is at the top. He's 81. Belichick is 70. And now their relationship, I think, takes center stage because A, they're the ones left. But B, things are not as good since Tom Brady left and came and went with his own validation and his victory. So as far as you understand their relationship right now, what is that like between Belichick and Kraft? Well, I think it's it's professionally probably as strong as it's ever been. Um, think about all the ups and downs that those two have been together. And, you know, at this point, I think that it's the impatience that's that's antsy for everybody. And obviously Robert Kraft has been very vocal stunningly vocal <laughs> about his displeasure with the Patriots recent drafts with some of their player development, um, hedging around the decision, you know, being vocal, believe me, he was upset that, you know, Bill didn't think he could play anymore. And then he goes out and wins the Super Bowl. And obviously the fact that they haven't won a playoff game in three years. And I, I wrote another thing that I'll just read from within the epilogue. Yep. It kind of gets at that. And I think that it'll, it's a good segue to talk about where the Patriots are now. The New England Patriots dynasty had officially come to a close on February 3rd, 2019, when they beat the Los Angeles Rams in the Super Bowl for their sixth championship. But the feeling the dynasty elicited, the knowledge that we were watching something special, ended when Brady walked away and was reignited with his return. When I say walked away, I meant like walked away from the game. Right. His brief month long retirement. It's what made his departure so unique. For as long as Brady was under center, he was the answer to every football question. Who else would you rather have with the ball in his hands? On a Monday play, on a critical one, on a third down, after he had thrown an interception with the playoffs or the Super Bowl on the line, he had managed to deliver a clinical certainty in a sport celebrated for its randomness. The idea of that certainty, his certainty, had proved astoundingly durable, maybe more than his durability as an athlete or a cultural figure. 
The NFL tried to move on to new teams and stars and belief systems, but, but the expansiveness of Brady, both as an ambassador and, and as a force on the field, was singular, failing to extend to his former team. After all, the current iteration of Bill Belichick's Patriots were a promising team on the rise, but one of many promising teams on the rise across the league. Robert Kraft was an owner deserving of a bust in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, but he was one of many football figures who deserved that honor, and one of many that the voters were in no rush to induct. So it's like that kind of like, you know, it's like when when Brady left, it wasn't only just like a, a, a decision that they made, and like you said, when he when he returned, you got to see that specialness. I mean, he just think about some of those third downs he converted late in the game where he was just deploying every bit of his resourcefulness against a head coach. Who's just as resourceful from the sideline. And, you know, they were just something special together. And now that they're apart, when you look at new England coming into this year, there's a lot of question marks, but they don't have that, that thing that we relied on for so many years as football watchers that somehow, some way they were always going to figure it out. Right. And you didn't have to grow up in the region, which I did, to understand that kind of sense. And sometimes it was like a fatalism on the other side of that. Right. Like, it's just here we go again. we're, we're, we're going to die. And I think, you know, part of that is, you know, I, I, this is top of mind because they recently wrote about Devin McCourty and Matthew Slater. And they're the last iteration of the mm-hmm. Patriot way. But the, the best coaches have their philosophy carried out in the locker room without saying anything. Brady did that better than anyone. And that was part of the certainty, you know, the, the, the arrogance, which kind of fed in of itself of we're going to win. This is going to happen was most made possible by him. Yes. Sometimes it was a defense and a scheme or a game plan or whatever it might've been. But like you said, you lose some of that certainty and that, that transference from the, the coaches, you know, room where they're game planning and, and asserting, you know, all these different things about how the game will going to go and what their culture is about. There's a loss there in that transfer. And I think when you see that sort of doubt, there's nothing to fall back on, be it Belichick's defense or Brady's offense, because you look at either side of the ball from a roster talent standpoint, it's average. It's just plain average, whether that's relative to the AFC or the NFL as a whole. And I think, you know, I, I emailed you and we have four factors here that we're going to go down as far as not predicting how the, the end of the era goes, but this is a pretty pivotal year. It might be an inflection point. It might not. We have on-field product. I just mentioned the roster talents about average. Their salary cap situation looks like they're going to really push their chips in next year. We have Bill versus time. The guy's 70. How long does he want to keep doing this? We have Robert versus time. You just obviously stealing here from Tom. Um, he's 81. You know, he, he's he's up for the Hall of Fame. He longs for that bust, how long it will take, uh, you know, is, is TBD. And then Mac Jones, because, you know, he replaces Brady in this sort of triumvirate. And how much does that quarterback play outweigh or be able to paper over the problems that we just covered, be it talent or, you know, the lack of stability and certainty you have within that locker room. So of those four, what do you got? What do you want to start with? Huh. Yeah. I mean, I was talking to a very famous Patriots fan the other day and I asked him how he thought the season was going. And he was like, this has nine and eight written all over it. <laughs> and, you know, again, though, you, you, you underestimate the Patriots at your own peril but the problem is, and this goes to both how they're where they are right now and the Mac Jones question, is that like Mac Jones has proven to be a competent quarterback. And you know, I think that Belichick knows how to develop quarterbacks. I think that like it's an underrated aspect of his repertoire, but competent is not gonna cut it in the AFC. I mean, Russell Wilson went to the NFC West. And the Broncos arguably might still have the fourth best quarterback in that division, <laughs> like especially with with what Josh McDaniels might do with Derek Carr. I mean, it's at least an argument. And the AFC is just completely overpopulated with talented quarterbacks. I mean, Matt Moran might be the ninth best quarterback in the conference right now. And so how they continue to improve and whether they're able to continue to improve. I mean, one of the things that I think that gets underappreciated about what Belichick and Brady and Ernie Adams and McDaniels and Charlie Weiss were able to do, and Scott Pioli I think was part of this too for a while, is stay ahead of the league. And, you know, every year Ernie Adams would go through all of Brady's snaps just looking for weaknesses. And he was one of many in the inside the building that would do that. And they were always able to help Brady stay ahead of his own weaknesses 
so that they were always a step ahead of defensive coordinators across the league. And with the situation that the offense is now, you have to wonder whether, A, they're going to be, even be able to be where they were last year to say nothing about whether they're going to be able to like, stay a step ahead of the league who has been studying Mac Jones for any edge. And I think that, like, you know, those are just pivotal questions going forward. Obviously, you've written ad nauseum about the offense. We've talked about it. Um, I haven't panicked as much as a lot of people, but I know that there's a lot of smart coaches around the league who think that Miami is going to win this weekend and think that, you know, that pass rush and the fact that the Patriots just seemed out of sorts throughout the preseason on offense and without, obviously they don't give a lot away, but they weren't even really establishing an identity. Mm. And I think that like, I think there's a lot of questions around there, despite the fact that I think that Belichick's earned the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, and I think Mac Jones is an interesting place to start. A, quarterback is important. Let's just, yeah. just say that. Uh, but B, you know, it, it, you mentioned staying ahead of the rest of the league. You can't talk about Mac Jones without tying it to the new offense because he is still a pocket-bound passer. He is not someone, as I think, you know, the conversations about quarterbacks and let's say NBA stars get closer and closer together in the way they dominate the game and they can control it because third and six, if the, you know, the chiefs have all of the receivers covered, Patrick Mahomes can still get that third down, either scrambling, extending the play or throwing the ball that no one else can. That's creating your own offense. Mac Jones can't do that yet. We haven't seen it yet. Maybe someday, but right now we can't. So he's limited by the confines of this offense, which was constructed within the limits of his new coaches who are Joe judge and Matt Patricia have one year of offensive coaching experience since I've said this before, the Bush administration. So <laughs> things are not great on that front. But the new stuff that we have seen is interesting, too, because you would think that some of those would want to address what we saw as weaknesses from Mac last year, primarily deep passing, short passing to intermediate over the middle. And so we've seen RPOs. We've seen some of the play action boot game very popular with the Shanahan's. It also goes back to some of what Al Groh was telling me. You know, they ran with the Browns in the early 90s. Like, it's not it's not all new, but. You know, he, again, as someone who cannot carry and create yet, is going to be reliant on the offensive lineman in front of him to block. He's pocket bound. And so to some degree, it doesn't matter what Mac Jones can do if he can't overcome the things around him, which isn't his fault. It's just the way that installing a new offense goes and how second year quarterbacks play. So I don't think it's fair, probably even through the end of the season, maybe and we'll see how this goes to have a conversation about whether he can elevate the team, even though. That might determine ultimately, as far as the on-field product goes, how the Belichick craft era ends. Because as I said at the beginning, quarterback's really important. Like that's 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 where it starts. And yet he might not be able to get started because of all the at least temporary roadblocks or fires they're trying to put out and try to determine their offensive identity around him. Absolutely. And you can't afford to just have his progression go backwards. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he's he's too valuable to that team. And I, I talked about it and, and, and I wrote about it in the book, but look, the, the, the Patriots offense, whether it's Patricia and judge who are executing what Belichick tells them to do is Belichick's offense. Mm -hmm. And it, even with the Browns at one point, he had 15 coaches on the coaching staff and no offensive coordinator. And his quotes from that time are exactly the same <laughs> as they are now. We know how to coach offense. Everybody pitches in. It's a group effort. I'm ultimately responsible. And so even if, Belichick has been on the learning curve with offense since the seventies when he was with the Colts, even if he learned so much about offense from the giant, you know, when he was with the giants and had to defend Bill Walsh and Joe Gibbs and his own offense and practice the run Earhart offense in practice and Dan Reeves and Don Shula and all of these in, you know, the Jim Kelly offense, even if he learned so much about that. And when he assembled his own playbook, took pieces from all of them, you know, their, their ideology was a lack of ideology. Yeah. Even if there are these fascinating business cases to be made and to learn from about how he's a total head coach, nobody is talking about those Browns offenses from the early nineties and how they set the league on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe themselves and, on fire, but yeah, I agree. <laughs> like nobody, nobody is talking about those. Now, obviously he's presided over historic offenses, 2007, 
one of the best examples, but there are a lot of them. And so you have to give him his due as an offensive mind. And, but, you know, he was thinking about taking more control over the offense back in 2018 when the assumption was that Josh was going to, Josh McDaniels was going to leave to go to Indianapolis. And Joe Judge was actually going to be the coach that he kind of elevated to help without giving him the coordinator title. So while there's precedent for this and the way that Belichick is, is deploying his charges and trying to figure out what their identity might be on offense while there's precedent for it. I think the stakes are different now and he doesn't have Tom Brady. <laughs> you know, when, when Charlie Weiss had left, they had won three Super Bowls. And when, you know, Josh McDaniels became the quarterback coach, but without the offensive coordinator title, mm -hmm. they were still working with a guy who had essentially made himself into a hall of famer at age 27. That's not the case now, obviously. Yeah, paper overing problems, the ability to take the theoretical up on the whiteboard and put it onto the field. Like those are things that Brady could do. That's what a future Hall of Famer can do. Mac Jones just isn't at that state yet. And that's why I think you see the limitations of the, the schemes you're drawing up. And also, you know, the, the biggest thing about experience to me is, is, is the clearest complaint about the coaching staff, right? Like you, we can accept the Matt Patricia and Joe Judge or at least replacement level coaches. But the problem is the same as McDaniels when he was younger, even in that first Super Bowl against the Giants. Your lack of experience means you have, you know, your problem solving skills are kind of in their infancy. The more experience you have, the more things you can draw from to say, when they see this, we need to do that. And they didn't have an answer in that Super Bowl. So when Matt Patricia and Joe Judge install this new offense, run into problems, which inevitably you do in the NFL season, they're not going to have the solutions as readily available, maybe not until Monday morning when they're reviewing the tape. Now, let's it's, say. Well, well, really quick. And it, yeah. and it puts more pressure on Belichick. Obviously, yeah. like, look. He's running the show. You think about that, that right before the Malcolm Butler interception in the Super Bowl, he's watching the sideline. Everybody's wondering, like, Bill, do you want to call timeout? Bill, do you want to do this? He's watching the sideline, and then he says goal line three, which, of course, is that three cornerback goal line defense, no safety. That ends up matching up perfectly, and Malcolm Butler and, and, um, Joe, you know, and um, Brandon Browner make you know, this amazing play. But – so he always has that capacity to call the play that he wants in the most critical situations as a head coach. But like you said, Josh McDaniel solved a lot of problems and the defensive coordinator, even back at that Super Bowl at the time was Matt Patricia, who had been in the, been comfortable in that role for a while. And so there's sometimes people say, well, who's going to call the, the plays for the Patriots? And there is a part of me that always wonders, like, does it matter? Yes. They, I did this story on Sean McVay in the off season and he showed me his play sheet from the Super Bowl. I mean, the plays on that play sheet are broken down by situation and circumstance to the nth degree. And I have to just assume that even though the Patriots are more, you know, game plan specific and situation and circumstance specific than any team ever, that there has to, you know, there has to be a little bit of commonality between that and, you know, what, Matt Patricia or Joe Judge will be holding on the sideline. But again, like you mentioned, that reservoir of knowledge mm -hmm. to be able to solve problems without Bill needing to solve them in the middle of the game, that will be really critical. And it's also going to be one of those things we're probably not going to know a lot about until a long time from now. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because I was waiting, at least in most of training camp, for Bill to flip back to the defense, not entirely, but not a, you know, 90% of his time invested in the offense and go back maybe to a 50-50, he might as well have just had his back to Steve Belichick and Gerard Mayo for the entirety of camp because that's how it was. They ran the defense, and Steve has called it now going on his fourth season, and Gerard is running the personnel groupings, and they run joint meetings and all these different things. But it'll be interesting to see because he is the best problem solver on that staff, no question about it. But is that best for the team? As we always hear, his default answer, which covers a lot of things when he doesn't want to comment on a particular topic, but in this instance – it's going to be really difficult to determine what's best for the team because, you know, you ignore too many phases for too long. Um, they might kind of rot when you're not, you're not looking, but um, all right. And, his, and yeah, really quick. And I mean, his genius is not staring at a play sheet during the game. Yeah. Watching the opposing coach and getting any kind of edge that, um, you know, obviously Pete Carroll, that's a great example of it. You remember in the Super Bowl, he's mic'd up. He's saying, where's McVeigh? Show me where McVeigh is. I mean, that's who he's looking at. He's not staring at a play sheet. Even when he was a coordinator with the Giants, his play sheet was pretty small. It was often just a card. And um, 
you know, he's done, he's managed games better than anybody in NFL history. And if he has to pro- problem solve for the offense so much because of problems, that the domino effect there could be really interesting. Right. Yeah. He's, he's kind of, you know, it's still a 20 year old reference plugged into the matrix a little bit when those games are going on. Like you can't do that and then also be calling plays back here in you know, the, the, the real world. So I think it's, it is interesting. I don't think he wants to divide his attention, but ultimately depending on how things go, that might be, as he says, what's best for the team. All right. Um, let's just say, as you mentioned, favorite, very famous fan of the Patriots, they do go nine and eight. And in light of the comments that you, you referenced, you know, and nine and eight, in the NFL, we know could very well be eight, nine. It could be seven, 10. It could be 10, seven. Pick it, pick a record. No one cares. It's in that range. In light of Robert Kraft's comments from three years ago without a playoff win, presumably one of those records would mean they go four without a playoff win. If the on-field product, which to me seems to be the leading factor in how long this era goes, um, is not up to historical, you know, bar, um, do you see, you know, a bar the Patriots must clear in the next two years for Belichick to be able to kind of safely control his own fate, as we always presumed the last two decades he would be able to? I have a hard time believing that Bill would ever be forced out. I just do, short of a health problem or something. I I don't know. I just have a hard time believing that. I mean, he's been so valuable to that franchise that even if he goes five years without a playoff win, to me, um, he's earned the right to exit on his own terms. That says, who knows? You know, I mean, like, we don't know. And... Um, again, the fact that Brady left and it was an organizational decision to let him go and he goes off and has that success, has a terrific year last year too. (laughs) I mean, obviously he was frustrated, but I mean, his numbers were astounding. He should have been MVP. Yeah. He nearly pulled off another huge playoff win. Um, you know, huge playoff second half comeback. I mean, just unbelievable. Um, I just think that like that the urgency from that just can't be underestimated and the lack of patience from that. That said, I still have a hard time believing that the Patriots won't have a new coach until Bill Belichick decides it's time to walk away. Yeah. And part of this, you know, whenever people like to bring up, Oh, we need to replace that player or this coach, I go, okay, who are you bringing in? Because you can't just make that decision in a vacuum or maybe you can scratch that itch for a day. Like you're still going to have a problem the next day. And what's your solution? No one out there in the market is really going to be better than the greatest coach of all time. And say what you will about a guy who's, you know, into his early 70s, but he has no signs of slowing down. So let's just let's go to Robert, though, because he he would be obviously the guy making this decision. He's 81. He's locked in on the Hall of Fame. He wants that to happen. Jonathan, his successor, is clearly in line. I mean, is there is there any way that Robert now runs the franchise differently as far as his pursuit of championships based on either his age is, you know, priorities all change for all of us as we get older and you care more about legacy or the fact that you just mentioned Brady left. That's kind of blown up in their faces to date. If he doesn't be able to turn that around, is there any reason for him to say we need to change course here in a way that he wouldn't have done the last 20 years? I don't know. I don't, I don't think that he is writing it materially different. Um, you know, I think that while Belichick and Kraft are both adaptive people. I, I think that their core is the same in terms of how they manage and how they try to lead. I, you know, there's a joke among owners that Robert, you know, when the when the organization does take a downturn or when Bill leaves, whatever it might be, that that's the exact moment he'll hand it to Jonathan. <laughs> I don't know if it's an assumption to be made that Robert ends up picking the next coach. I think that like the idea that Jonathan, you know, might be doing that, I don't think is far fetched at all. And that would change the dynamic around the building a lot, not only because obviously Jonathan's a different human than Robert is, and you're replacing Belichick, who by the time he walks away might have more wins than anybody in NFL history. But Jonathan has had a front row seat (laughs) to this winning, to Belichick's mind. I don't think any owner has ever, you know, except for the ones like way back in the day, like Al Davis, who was actually, you know, a Hall of Fame mind who ascended to the owner's box. Paul Brown, you know, obviously people like that. But it's like never in modern history have we had someone who's going to be running a team who has so much insight into football excellence and no matter who the next coach is 
they're coming into a different situation. I can't see Jonathan Kraft handing complete autonomy <laughs> and all football responsibility to whoever the next coach might be simply because Jonathan actually might know more about a lot of those decisions than the new coach coming in. Yeah, it is really interesting how much of that front row seat, you know, and not really knowing much about Jonathan besides hearing a few things here and there, just that, you know, are there things in the back of his mind that he would have wanted to do this? Not that he's afraid to speak his mind now or when he's in charge. Like you just dream and wonder about something for so long. And then that time maybe gets squeezed into a window that was shorter than you expected. Do you feel rushed to enact what you've always imagined? Or do you try to evaluate based on what is in front of you, based on what you've always been dreaming about? And I think, you know, as far as Bill goes, look, it's safe to say he's not uh, in a place now that he expected to be the other side of 70, Marv Levy territory, yeah. still coaching going on. But the dude is showing zero signs of slowing down. Like, I, I don't, he's, 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 you know, I've heard from coaches who just say, we are working. And that's true year round, but it is nonstop in there. And they've had a couple more weekends off in the summer. I don't think there's a whole lot to put in there, but that means if they're in the building, he's in the building. Whenever that time comes though, where he has to, you know, loosen the reins a little bit. I mean, he's, is he taking a stance of what we thought Brady was doing when he just kind of wants to step away at the peak of his powers, or is he going to be in there until it's, you know, maybe he's not working as much as we've seen him. How, how do you think that eventually comes about? I mean, I don't think anything makes him feel more alive and, you know, his kids are grown. You get to see two of them any day that they're all in the office. Um, you know, as we know, when when very driven people get older, they don't become less of themselves. They become more like all of those urges are just amplified. I think it's one of the reasons why Brady has such a hard time walking the way and, and maybe Belichick, too. But, you know, I mentioned the, the Sean McVay story I did earlier. Here's a guy who's 36 years old who has nearly burned himself out, <laughs> never had a day under 500. He wakes up at 345 in the morning in the off season and heads to the office. He has met Bill for beers. He's studied him. He has done everything that he is, that he can to be as excellent in this profession and this craft as he could in a short amount of time. And by all accounts, I mean, he he's off to a historic start, mm -hmm. but even he knows he can't do what Bill does now. He calls it competitive stamina. Yes. And I mean, he doesn't have it. And he wonders, like, who was it? I think it was Michael Lombardi who said that by the time Bill leaves for the summer, he's already scouted two of the major conferences in college football personally <laughs> and written up something like 2,000 players. I, I think that's what he said. Um, I believe it. Sean McVay is not doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, so I think that there's just a reason why Belichick is special and, you know, being that singular, having that sort of singular devotion, it's the only thing he's done his entire adult life. Um, it's one of those things that's intimidating, awe-inspiring for his peers. And, you know, it, it also just explains why, well, of course he hasn't left yet. Even though he loves to take shots at Marv Levy, going back to when they were at the Browns. And, you know, even though he took a crack at him there in the, in the NFL films documentary, you know, of course he hasn't left because he still feels like there's things he wants to do. Right. Yeah. And I think it's, it's interesting too, because let's just cut to the, the overall chase. I mean, at this point, the way we've been talking and I think, you know, I remember getting these questions when I first came on the beat in 2018, how much longer do you think Brady's going to keep at it or Belichick? I'm like, Ask me in three or four years because it's probably going to be the same answer. And right now, I think that seems to be a safe timeline. Like that's that's how this era is going to go. And part of it is Belichick is still playing the long game when it comes to this rebuild. They didn't spend in free agency. You can you know bicker whether that's you know Kraft's decision in terms of actual cash you know going out or Bill trying to manage a salary cap in the way that he sees best. But either way, they're both in it for the long haul. And that speaks to this era is not ending any time soon, which I said at the beginning is not what anyone's rooting for. But it is an interesting, unique dynamic when you consider, you know, an owner with six Super Bowl rings, you know, a coach with eight and still pursuing more. And they don't feel like they're going to stop anytime soon. So the fact that there are some obvious roadblocks here, you know, the loaded AFC, new offense, you know, quarterback, you know, maybe it's just 
these are interesting now, but the real interesting part is going to come in 2023 when those coaches will have a year in the system. Mac Jones will have made a year two leap or will be a third year guy knowing what weaknesses he needs to fix. And they might lose some guys on defense, but overall they should be better because the drafts have also started to turn around. I mean, do you see already any of 2023 kind of being more interesting than maybe what we're going to deal with the eight, nine, nine and eight coming up here in a few weeks, days, oh, months? I can't even think that far ahead, but like, <laughs> but I do think that, you know, as you mentioned the offense, like one thing that's interesting is like, um, when you have someone like Josh, who had so much autonomy and so much expertise, you know, when they leave and clearly the Patriots have been trying to run a new offense, right? Streamlined is the word getting people to play faster. Um, and by all accounts, there haven't been that many great days running it in practice or in the preseason. If they decide to junk what they were doing and try to revert to a version of the offense that Mac was running last year, let's just say that, you, you know, they're running, they're running Josh McDaniel's offense without him calling the plays. And there's a difference, you know, there's a gap there. Like you think about when Kyle Shanahan left Atlanta, Matt, you know, mm -hmm. he'd gotten Matt Ryan to be a league MVP. Steve Sarkeesian takes over they say they're running the same offense, but they're not. <laughs> they're, Steve Sarkeesian is calling plays. Kyle Shanahan is running Kyle Shanahan's offense. And so, you know, I guess that, like, you know, thinking ahead to 2023 is kind of, um, you know, beyond my capacity at this point. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, like, I'll, I'll, I'll learn from your writing. Uh, I'd sprung that on you, to, to be fair. But, you know. No, no, just... but I'll learn from your, from your expertise about how to think about that. But, you know just getting through this year and what the Patriots look like in mid October, middle of the season, Thanksgiving. Um, you know, I, I, that to me is, 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 you know, where my mind is at. And um, there's a lot of people with a lot of curiosity around the league who are doing the exact same thing. I mean, there's a lot of people who just have read reports about the Patriots offense this year and just thought the entire thing was a cluster. You know what? Yeah. And I, I've said this before and, you know, it's they're holding back a lot as you coaches are wont to do in the preseason and training camp and even when installing a new offense. That's great. You know, but like you can't get on to courses 300 and 400 and above if you can't master the 100 level stuff, which is, I think, why we're all raising the alarm initially. But part of that is going to be understanding that, yes, until mid-October, as you mentioned, they see it as an extension of the preseason. Belichick saying just as recently as last week. I think there's some truth to that. The other thing about Belichick this summer speaking, which has piqued my interest to kind of bring this even all the way back to Brady, he leads off training camp throwing bouquets at Mac Jones for the work he's done in the offseason. And part of this to me is media making a big deal out of something that we make a stink of in the first place and then Bill corrects course. And then we go, oh, well, what is he doing there? Like if he's just speaking the truth, A, we should all be rooting for that. And if Mac Jones did all that work in the offseason, great for him to earn that. But it's continued with other players in a way that I don't think speaks to an overall you know, softness in his tone or certainly not in his personality. But I'm wondering if the specific praise for Mac before they've had a snap of training him might have been learning his lesson from Brady leaving. And you correct me if I'm wrong, where Mac needs to feel appreciated to some degree, even if it's just comments in a post press conference or a pre training camp, training camp press conference that talks about work he's done before the real work has begun, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, all that stuff is an interesting evolution. And obviously like, you know, Bill sometimes says things that are incredibly calculated and sometimes he just kind of blurts things out, you know, but like during the first half, when, you know, when Brady was in the Mac Jones years, I mean, he would, it was so obvious that Brady was his boy and that even if on a personality level, I mean, Brady would get pissed, you know, when they cut, lawyer Malloy or things like that, but it was just so obvious that they were aligned, that they were joined, that they were going to go into battle together, that they complemented each other well. And, you know, it wasn't long before Belichick was saying, you know, there was no quarterback I'd rather have than Tom Brady, which was kind of unequivocal praise. It was later, like, for instance, when Jimmy Garoppolo came in, when Brady was suspended and Belichick says, you know, it was a seamless transition. <laughs> to be running the offense, you know, stuff like that. I thought was, was interesting. I don't read it a whole lot into, you know, the compliments he gives to Mac Jones. It, uh, you know, I think that like from the Brady camp perspective, I don't think that they care what he says about Mac Jones, but people definitely noticed 
in 2020 when you have Cam Newton, who is missing passes that he used to hit in his sleep. <laughs> and, you know, the Patriots are, are not the same offensive team in any way that they were, you know, the previous two decades. And, you know, Bill was going out of his way to compliment Cam's leadership and ability and, and performance. That definitely was noticed. There's no doubt. I mean, you know, it was right there, you know, after a big playoff game, the AFC championship against the Jaguars, where Brady, you know, leads them back, you know, again in patented style with that gash on his, on his hand. And, you know, Bill mumbles that, you know, we're not talking about open heart surgery here. I mean, <laughs> Okay. That was, that was a different that was a different time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. So I think we arrived at an answer as far as how the, the era ends is um what I said in 2018 and what I'm gonna say probably in 2025. Check back in three or four years. I'll be there. Yeah, excellent. All right, a uh, couple last ones. Uh yeah. for people who haven't bought the read the book yet, you've done more than enough already reading some of the epilogue, things you dug up from last season on the Brady side, the Patriots side. You know, one last kind of elevator pitch here by your book, it's better to be feared because. Well, I think that what the Patriots accomplished appreciates with age. And every year you see another Super Bowl champion struggling to repeat, sometimes struggling to make the playoffs. And you see just how hard sustained success is in the NFL. The entire thing is, you know, reverse engineered to pull teams back to earth if they get too high. and. You know, the only things that I set out to do with that book are to show as best as I could the inside story as to what led to their greatness from a psychological, a ability, a physical ability, um, the scars that they accumulated along the way, all of those perspectives, and then show what the cost of that greatness has been. And um, I think that, you know, to me, my entire goal was just to do the best I could to show a full, well-rounded, 360-degree look at, um, you know, how these special people came together, what it was that they were able to achieve together, and what are the personal professional costs of that. And I think that you see some of those things playing out quite a bit, yeah. even now. That's really well said. And I think, honestly, I'll just flip over the other side of the book. I mean, the testimonials, I think, Bill, this might have been your famous Patriots fan friend, said nine and eight, the definitive document. Like, you pulled it off on the whole dynasty of what was also, you know, you wrote in the book called the Kremlin. Like, there's a reason that it takes years to crack. And sometimes <clears throat> reporters in the Boston Herald, four years to do it. So it's uh, it's a lot. And it's 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 incredibly dense. It's something that I've already read twice. So obviously, folks at home who listen to this podcast, if you don't have it, buy it. Um, Seth, was there anything from this upcoming season, not 2023 or beyond, uh, to to stress this out here that we didn't cover? Anything that kind of interests you? The offense you talked about a lot, Mac, Bill, but anything that kind of slips through the cracks there? I mean, we've covered it a lot, but of course, like, you know, the entire conversation, as you mentioned, and almost on-field dedication from Belichick has been about the offense. And of course, there is an entire other side of the ball. And, <laughs> you know, to, to say nothing of special teams that like, you know, we really have no idea. It was the Patriots' defense that obviously had no answer for the Bills in the playoffs last year. No answer at all. And, um, you know, again, some good players on the defense, some aging players in other spots. Where do we – is that unit going to continue to improve? Are they better against Josh Allen than they were last January? You know, that's a huge question just as much as whether the Kyle and Mike Shanahan outside zone and bootleg off of it will work. Right. And how much of that, too, is, you know, maybe you mentioned they always look to stay ahead of the league. RPOs and passing game and the play action bootlegs, a, RPOs were popular five, seven years ago. They were around long before then. Like if the Patriots now feel behind the curve as it goes to offensively. But, of course, it's always a matter of how you execute versus – you know, any doing any something new, like innovating does not correlate necessarily with success um, on the field. But yeah, I'm with you. I think, look, the problem solving an offense is going to be one thing defensively that starts Buffalo in the division because you are most certainly looking straight up at them now, not down in any one of the AFC East, which also might include Miami, who's taken three out of four from them. And I think is a real nightmare matchup in week one. But as we know now, week one is 
is watered down. It matters less than it ever has just because of the nature of the preseason and one extra game at the end. Um, Absolutely. And I'll just say that, like, you know, Belichick, once they started to have success in the early part of the century, he set up a system to, you know, make himself immune to coordinators coming and going. He knew that people would be hiring from him nonstop. And so he essentially set up an infrastructure to maintain continuity. You know, those meetings just with Brady, boiling the game down to, to the essence. And um, there was people who wondered back then if he was stretched too thin. Then obviously they have the turnaround, win three more Super Bowls with a veteran coaching staff who had, you know, kind of come at age during that time. Now Belichick at age 70 almost seems like he's getting pulled in more directions and stretched more thin than ever. Um, again, what's the real effect of that? we're likely aren't going to know for a couple years until, you know, some people are willing to be honest about it um, if they ever do. But I do think that that's one of those things that I think is really interesting. Just at age 70, the Patriots are more reliant on one man, their head coach than, than, I mean, since it's been in a very long time. And for an NFL team that has one of the smallest coaching staffs across the league, and they have plenty of analysts, but you look on offense and it's a really great point because it's not just, Bill going over there, Matt, Patricia, and Joe Judge. You've got guys like Ross Douglas, who I wrote about being the youngest position coach in the entire league. He's 27. He was a defensive player in college and coached corners last year. Yeah. Brett Brown is, is your veteran now. Nick Cayley's been around for five years in that offense. But then you're looking at Vinny Tonseri, first year on his own. Offensive line, Matt Patricia, again, you know, Billy H, third year as being an assistant there. Like you have newness and inexperience all across the board as he might see them as, oh, if you can coach, you can coach. Well, it's it's going to take some time, but it sounds like I think we again have agreed that they're going to get that time. It's just a matter of what you do to make it. But I think, I, you know, the upside of this is I think if you look at last year as a roadmap, start two and four, hit your stride, nine and four, and fall apart at the end. The, the way the schedule works out might be very similar. Like you have a lot of high pressure defenses that are experienced and know how to attack them. Will play a lot of man coverage, but then you get your Detroit's, your Cleveland's, Chicago's, the Jets. The Colts, Jets again, like, you know, there's a way for them to hit their stride as much as everyone probably will freak out here to start. If there's one constant over the past 20 years is that the <laughs> Jets will always raise their hands to help the Patriots hit their stride right when they need it. Yeah, both of them straight up in the air. I remember saying that in Kevin Clark's pod. I was like, if there's anything we know, even 2020, the Jets still suck. You always have the Jets. It's just how that goes. Um, Seth, this was great. Do you have anything else to plug uh, coming up either, you know, on ESPN.com or elsewhere? No, man. I mean, I've got a couple stories working that I hope fans will enjoy. But, um, you know, the best thing about my job is that, like, I get to, like, really dive as deep as I can into stories and they kind of run absent of, of timing, you know, whether it be schedule or whatever it might be. And so I've got I've been traveling a lot. It's been a busy summer. It was a really busy spring, um, but it's fun. And hopefully I've got a couple of things the first couple of months of the season that fans will like. All right. Well, everyone just circled giant months on their calendar just Seth is coming out something here around there uh due to that but that's look that's that's the dream that's the best possible case scenario and you deliver so they should keep letting you have that time and space to write those up um Seth Wickersham ESPN thanks so much for uh, coming on the pod my pleasure man thank you all right back down to wrap up with answers to your mailbag questions but first one more thanks to Seth great guy obviously phenomenal reporter and writer and I think we're gonna have him back that was some really terrific insight from a guy who has been like few have Ground floor, day one or day two with Brady, Belichick, and Kraft, and understanding kind of all the dynamic behind the scenes at play, and literally wrote the book on them. So, moving on. Uh, mailbag, leading off. Adam on Twitter wants to know, quote, if Matt Patricia is to become a good offensive coordinator, what do you think would be his biggest strength? Adam notes that his quotes, not mine. Matt gets a lot of credit for being a smart football mind. How does that translate to offensive success? I think when you talk about being an offensive mind, something I've noted, I think I did with Seth, is that, you know, Matt understands the game, right? He can draw anything up on a whiteboard, the interplay of, you know, how offenses want to attack and the proper defense's response. And being a smart guy, of course, does not ensure that you're right all the time. We have seen Bill Belichick be wrong plenty of times, and he will be the first to admit that. I think the strength for him is going to be teaching during the week in the classroom Here's what's going on defensively. This is what they want to do to you. The thing is, of course, coaching is much more than just your intelligence. And that's the part that needs to translate and be put into bite size for the players so they can carry that out and go play at 100 miles an hour. In addition to making adjustments on the sideline where he might see and recognize what's going on, 
But how well do you communicate that? How well do you inspire? How well do you organize as a coach to do that offensively, which is a totally different task than doing it on defensively, even though, again, you might be understanding what's happening on the other side. How do you enact those adjustments through your player? So I think when it comes to breaking down opponents, that's his strength. He'll know what the defense is doing, how they're doing it, their specific rules and assignments. But then it's a matter of how do you get your offensive players to attack that and then adjust mid-game, which is all, of course, going to be new for him. Chris on Twitter wants to know defensive strategy versus Miami. Cover three, question mark. Okay. First of all, one single coverage is never going to be the answer to any team. And this doesn't just go for Miami. The Patriots, like every NFL team, have a call sheet full of different coverages and different wrinkles. Um, you know, from those coverages, be it through different personnel or reactions to formations or blitzes, whatever. So when you talk about just cover three versus cover one or cover two, the answer is none of them. It's a combination. And how much do you play them in different scenarios and against different personnel groupings? Now, zooming out, yes, you can have a couple of different tenets of your game plan. Like we need to double Tyree Kill on third down. We need to stop inside runs. Okay. We need to tackle well. Within those tenets, you break down. Okay. We're going to stop Tyree Kill on third down. We're probably going to play some more too high coverages, or we're going to put two men on him, literally on third downs in sort of a bracket. That's when you start to get in your calls. You start big picture and come all the way down. So yeah, cover three could probably fit in. What I would do though is probably lean into what I just said. Play some light boxes and play too high because the quickest way that you lose this game is seeing Tyreek Hill go for a 60-yard touchdown. Now, this gets into the argument of how strong is Tua's arm. And again, we'll talk about this later this week when we really dive into Miami. But Hill and Waddle in limiting their yards after the catch has to be priority number one. Okay, You can give up the free stuff underneath and the Patriots will play a fair amount of man coverage because they trust Jonathan Jones and Tyreek Hill. Not as much as anyone else in the league, but he's got a good combination of of quicks and long speed um, to match up with Hill. He'll get some help. But beyond that, you know, I think you just have to do your best to limit big plays because you can get gashed in the run game as they have and did last year in Miami, but still survive. Okay, they were still in it to the end before they gave up that touchdown uh, to the Dolphins as time expired. So he'll take those. Gains in the ground, even though the Dolphins' offensive line is better, you just can't get put behind early with a big score to Hill or Waddle because then you're playing the game on their terms. They can run or they can throw, and ultimately that's a position the Patriots can't afford to be, particularly in their opener with a new offense. So you've got to limit Hill and Waddle, and it's not going to just be cover four or cover two or two-man or six or any sort of split field stuff. It's going to be some sort of combination of those, and we'll get to that later this week. Okay, Jake on Twitter. Sort of a meta question. Love these. Um, unless they're meta with a capital M and I'm talking Facebook. Uh, what are some of the pitfalls of the reporter fan relationship and what do you wish could improve? I, you know, I I think this is different for everyone, right? You know, if you're someone who's not a, a whole lot on social media, you, your interactions with fans are probably limited. I think there, it's not unlike any complaints that people might have about social media generally. It can get kind of toxic. And particularly when you're covering a sports team, you know, people and, and you probably at home listening start to discuss the team as like I or we, right? Like, oh, we suck on third down. We can't tackle. We can't run the ball. We're doing so well. Like, oh my God, we're going to win 10 games. So you identify with the Patriots. Like when, and when bad things are said or reported on them, you know, be it a film analysis or some guy gets suspended or Belichick makes a, a just an objectively bad call, you take it personally. Because again, you conceive of that or any fan does, you know, in New England or elsewhere as being a part of the team. It's how you speak about it. It's how you conceive of it. And so that, I think, draws out feelings that feel a little bit more personal and attacked. And you get, you know, people like me and the other end getting some of the vitriol from that, which is whatever. I understand the dynamic. My thing is, you know, I, I love the interaction because I get to know what you care about. I get to know what you think. This is why we we do these mailbags. I was on the other end of this once upon a time, rooting for teams in the NFL and in college and basketball and baseball. Like, I still do with the Sox and the Celtics. And, you know... I'm writing because you're reading, okay? I'm doing a podcast because you're listening. That dynamic has to always exist, or I have a job. So it's something I'm grateful for, and you want to hear from you. Of course, the people who just want to be a jerk or troll or whatever it might be, look, that's fine. It's your choice. My attitude towards my mentions or you know, people in the comment section is kind of like if you're on the street, right? Like if you can prove to me within the 10 seconds that I'm walking by, either by screaming or just kind of being a jerk, like, yeah, I'll block or mute you. I, I I don't have to deal with that anymore, nor should anyone at home. If you're just a stranger and that's the impression you manage in 10 seconds or 240 characters, 
you know, if you disagree with something or you're mad, maybe we could talk about it. I'm here walking in this, you know, theoretical street to inform. That's the job to report, to talk about it. If you want to have a conversation, I'm here. So that's really it. I don't think it's anything different really than walking uh, on the street, which is the long way, weird metaphorical way of saying this. And now we're going to hit the eject button and move back. So <laughs> last uh, last mailbag question. Uh, Danny via Twitter wants to know, who is your ideal offensive coordinator hire for the Patriots? Well, we are uh, six to seven months too late for this, but given the options uh, in-house, because the Patriots are committed to running their offensive system, as you heard um, Seth Wickersham described that they built a system that's kind of self-sustaining, doesn't need coordinators, thanks to Belichick. I would have gone with Nick Cayley. He's the most experienced offensive assistant on the staff. He has been with the tight ends, which is a position, as you've heard me say before, is the most involved in the offense after the quarterback. You're run blocking, you're pass blocking, obviously you're catching passes. Okay, they have to understand the game almost at a quarterback's level. So people coaching them have to be able to coach it at that same sort of level and have their hands in all these different areas. And I believe it was Nick Cayley who was running the red zone offense last year and coaching that. I'm not positive, um, but I, I'll have to double check. And that's also, of course, a real high leverage, really important uh, part of the team. So Cayley would have been my pick um, because those are the parameters within how Belichick wants to run the football operations is keep it in-house, people familiar with the system and let all those cogs in the machine keep on rolling. So this has been a long episode. Um, hope everyone had a good holiday weekend. Like I said, we will be back at the end of this week, getting ready for the Dolphins. I gotta tell you, this does not look like a great matchup to me, but we've got a long way to go, as you have heard, and you will continue to hear. But bottom line, real football is back. I can't wait. Bills Rams, at least on Thursday night, a little appetizer before we get to Sunday. I will be down in Miami all week covering practices there at uh, West Palm Beach at Palm Beach Atlantic University, a real place without a real football program. We're going to find out how that works. But until then, keep it here. Leave us a review. Say hi on Twitter. Again, you got 240 characters. There's a lot to say without getting muted or blocked. Um, we'd love to hear from you. More questions in the mailbag always coming. And uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>